Good morning. I have a little test for you. Repeat after me. 7 p.m. Friday, April 28th. Very good. That, that's, you'll see later in the service why that was a test because we're going to sing a song responsively and one part is in italics, one part is bold. The italics part is for me, the bold part is for you, and if in doubt, just sing anyway. Friday, April 28th at 7 p.m., we're having a concert here fe featuring Mark Cruz. He's a guitarist that I know who's been through the Minneapolis area several times over the years. He lives in Florida now, so he's coming a long way to come and give us a concert here at Advent. And he's very multi-talented. One thing he does is plays a two-neck guitar, and he plays out on the strings in ways that I cannot explain. But uh, it will be not something like you've seen be seen and heard before, and he's a good guy too. So if you can come or tell your friends about that too, that would be great. It's free. There's a free will offering, but it's 7 p.m. Friday, April 28th. With that, let's join in singing our opening song, God is Here, verses 1 and 4, if you're looking at the hymnal on 660. I love my big booming voice. I'll try to pull back my diaphragm. All right, so uh, welcome to Advent United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Grant, the youth pastor here. Uh, pastor Eric is on a well-deserved rest from the Easter Holy Week. And so this church for the last seven days has been under the complete command of Pastor Grant and Ms. Lindsay. So, and it's still here, nothing burned down. So I think, I think we're good, I think we're good. I don't know, did anyone else kind of have this sort of dream when you were driving to church that maybe the last few days were sort of like a, a mirage, right? Because you kind of, but you know, maybe you doubt that uh, summer is coming. Look at your program to catch the joke on that one. But anyway, so um, summer is coming, spring is here, spring is here at Advent. So there you go. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us in person. We're certainly glad with you worshiping with us online. And we hope that this service will provide both sort of a Sabbath from your last week, a chance to rest and reprieve yourselves, and also a foundation to spring forward for, for this week. The flowers today at the altar were donated by Andrea Mowry in loving memory of Annika Nelson. And so now, let us uh, share this time uh, together in worship, and let's uh, stand and greet each other with the uh, peace of Christ.
Let's remain standing as we go to this is the day. And if the, you follow this italics for me, bold for you, and if in doubt, just sing. Let's have some fun with this. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. With us rejoice, let us rejoice, and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord And let us remain standing for this centering prayer. God, speak to us this day. Guide us off the path leading to conformity of hopelessness and lead us into a place where we can renew our minds. Show us how we might be transformed by your spirit to live an abundant life in you. Amen. You may be seated.
The scripture reading this morning is from John 20, verses 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, look at my hands, put your hand into my side, no more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, Laura. So I believe that this scripture is definitely one of those that taken out of context has caused a lot of harm to a lot of people, especially during some very troubling times that they have actually had. So I would like to do my part here to mitigate some of that harm. I'm gonna be sharing my own faith journey. Uh, and then I'm gonna follow that with sort of feelings about doubt and then hopefully give you some hope at the end, hopefully. So, I'm going to start my faith journey by saying something somewhat controversial. Um, I don't like to repeat myself up here, but I did actually talk about my faith journey way back in 2017. That's the peril of being here for six years, by the way. At some point, you're probably going to repeat yourself, but I am coming at it from a different angle, so I hope that's okay. Also controversial is that in 2017, my mother was not watching me. Hi, Mom. So, so as I start talking about some of this, uh, I'm sure in about three hours my mom will call me and say, what did you mean by that? So, here we go. So, when I was uh, basically grades five, four and five, I was starting to get into some trouble. Now, my family, we did go to an Anglican church, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that regular. It's okay because you were busy, but it wasn't that regular. Uh, we did go, and... Um, but I was getting into trouble, so my mother decided that you should go to Catholic school so that, quote, the nuns could beat some sense into you, unquote. Now, I actually had a really good experience for seven years in Catholic school. I, uh, I got along well with the nuns, I got along well with the monks, I got along well with the, uh, with the priests. Uh, I was actually almost confirmed, so for you confirmation people, I just want to point out, I had to write essays, I had to do tests, I had to do so much stuff, and then at the end, I was in my little robe ready to go up, and then one of the uh, students volunteered to one of the uh, teachers that, he's not Catholic. And so at the last moment, I got yanked out on, as everyone was up. So I was nearly confirmed, but it's okay, don't worry, I know your youth pastor is supposed to be in charge of the confirmation process, you might be worried. I was ordained, and that was a lot harder, so that's fine. But anyways, after seven years of this, I came out of that with a pretty Catholic worldview. And then, I still had some doubts, but I had a pretty Catholic worldview. 
I then went off to college, right? And that's when I started meeting other people from different kind of faith traditions, some of them having no faith traditions. And they, there was lots of contradictions in what they were actually believing. And so that's when I kind of entered to a stage of the agnostic stage. Gnosis just means no, a ah is the opposite, agnostic, agnostic, okay? So just, I didn't know. I didn't know what's right, what's the truth, I didn't know. And so then, um, the other thing too, by the way, I'm in early college. I'm trying to, you know, get my life together. I'm trying to, in theory, find somebody uh, to tolerate me for the rest of my life. So I have all this going on. And uh, so I was pretty passive about it. I really wasn't seeking anything. So I became sort of a passive agnostic. I don't know and I don't care. And then I met a wonderful Baptist lady. It's right there. And, uh, and so she brought me into the world of the North American Baptist world. And there was a lot of stuff in the North American Baptist world that was very, very, very compelling to me. And one of them, one of the things that were compelling to a young man who's, who's seeking something, or not even sure what he's seeking, is they had a sort of a joyful certainty. They knew what the truth was, and they were very joyful about it. And their answer to doubt, because I had plenty, their answer to doubt was, well, just have faith. Just have faith. It'll be revealed in time. Or, be even worse to my ears, maybe you're not meant to know. Right? So, so these things were resonating strongly in my head. And uh, I will say that that period of the North American Baptist Grant was a period that definitely lit something within me, for sure. But eventually my faith, the way I understood my faith anyway, it wasn't working. Doubt prevailed, and in the end, my faith basically bent, shattered, and, uh, and broke. And that drove me into the active agnostic phase. So I didn't know what was up, but I was driven to find something. I was driven to find something. I had sort of an answer to doubt, and the answer was definitely a, I felt a big push, like keep looking, keep searching. So in my little active agnostic phase, I went even deeper into the Bible. I went deeper into other uh, faith traditions that aren't particularly Christian. And... Um, I wanted to know more about the Bible, I wanted to know more about the history, the context that the scripture was written in, who was it written for, who was it written by. And all this time, I'm still in the North American Baptist uh, Church, so of course, what's happening is, uh, I'm what I, I've called earlier a pew conscript, someone who's forced to be there, right, sort of listening over and over again to stuff that I don't necessarily agree with. And it was kind of a painful period, so I'm just going to say for any of you pew conscripts out here or forced online, I understand it. I get it. I get where you are, and, and, and I have a lot of empathy for you. So I was still an agnostic, but I was driven. I was, I was, I was a seeker. I was an active agnostic. Then, through reasons I'm not going to get into, my family, I moved down south here. South, being, I'm from Canada, by the way. So I, I come uh, south, and I actually, uh, we find a Methodist church. There aren't really Methodists in Canada, so you guys were a complete mystery to me as to what you actually were. But it was sort of this Methodist church, and the, the thing that was cool about this Methodist church is that they were all seekers. Almost everyone I met, I mean, were, were actually seeking something. They may not have necessarily agreed with what was going on, but they were all seeking something. It was a community of seekers. And then, driven by my own doubt, I entered seminary, I entered towards ordination. And what I want to say about that is that I didn't go to seminary to become a minister. I didn't go to seminary to become a youth pastor either. I went to seminary as driven by doubt because I wanted to basically know. I wanted to know what the heck is going on in this, in this tradition. So I dove deeper into Methodism. And what I found there was a big tent philosophy. In theory, Methodism is meant as a tradition to encompass a diversity of beliefs. I found an open table, a table where in communion, you don't have to be a Methodist to come up to this table. You don't have to be a member of this church to come up to this table. You don't have to even be a Christian, I would argue, to come up to this table. You just simply have to be seeking. I found in the Wesleyan tradition the idea of the quadrilateral, the idea that uh, you can look at any sort of question with your reason, tradition, and experience through the lens of Scripture. I found in there that the, also the three simple rules, which the conf confirmands better know within a couple weeks. The do no harm, do uh, good, and 
pay attention to the ordinance of God, or as most people will say, stay in love with God. The three simple rules. I found in there a balance, a discipleship balance between personal piety and social holiness, between acts of justice and acts of uh, charity or mercy. And all of this was against a backdrop of Christianity. And all this helped me find a deeper relationship with my own faith. Now, do you doubt this? It's okay, because you're not alone. You're actually in pretty decent company. Abraham and Sarah are, had doubted that they were going to have you know, a child, let alone a nation. Moses doubted he could lead his people from Egypt. The entire nation of Israel is in constant state of doubt. Israel itself is a word-meeting struggle with God. They are constantly struggling with, with their faith. And various disciples, disciples that actually lived and ate with Jesus, they were doubting who Jesus was and what Jesus' message was virtually the entire time, even beyond the entire time as we encounter in Good Friday. And then we get Thomas. So, if you are doubters, you're in good company. You're in God company. But I'm convinced that abundant life doesn't exist with passive doubt, just sort of sitting in doubt, don't know, don't care. Abundant life isn't there. Abundant life exists in active doubt. And there are actually three reasons why active doubt is actually a good thing. First of all, it's a sign of alertness. Here's a quick story. When my kids were little, I would ask them after they came back from school, I'd say, did you have a good day? Yes. Did you make lots of friends? Yes. Did you get your homework done? Yes. Eventually, I knew they weren't listening. So I'd say, are you an elephant? And if they said yes, bang, I caught you, right? You are not listening. You're not alert. Being in active doubt means that you're not just accepting what you were given. You're not letting your eyes become accustomed to the dark. You are actively, actively there. You're actively listening. It's also a sign of having to grow. So true doubt is always seeking, always growing your knowledge. And all of us in this room and online and on this planet, all of us have room to grow. Uh, and to quote a great local theologian named Sean Scow, Sean Scow is Gene Scow, uh, uh, his partner is right here, so it's, it's fun to talk about him. But as we were talking about this, as I was getting ready for the sermon, I was talking about Sean. Sean does a lot of uh, 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 volunteer, he's a youth leader with us. He says, well, we talked about it anyway, and we said that the opposite of doubt is not faith. The opposite of doubt is certainty. Now, certainty is fine, and it's a time saver in most of the areas of your life, right? Uh, it's in areas that you don't need to grow, certainty is, is not a bad deal. However, if you are certain, that means you have an answer. If you have the answer, you're not going to continue to ask any questions. Your curiosity dies, and you stop growing. So if you want to uh, continue to grow in your relationship with God, you have to be ready to seek. You have to be ready to seek out the next question and not just settle for certainty. And then the last thing about uh, doubt is it's definitely a sign that you are alive because you know what? Dead people don't doubt, right? So, so you're, you're alive, you're growing. Doubting is basically proof of life. Now, true doubt compels us to allow the questions. It compels us to follow the questions, even live the questions, and fearlessly chase out the new questions that come from the answers from the old questions. So I'd say when I look at my faith journey here, the passive agnostic stage was the least amount of growth out of the entire set. Right? Every other set is me being challenged by something and taking some kind of doubt and propelling me into the next, into the next stage. Doubt has propelled me through my relationship with God, and I believe doubt has formed me into the person that I am now, and doubt will continue to shape and form me as I continue to grow. So through all my doubts, this is what I find compelling. I find in this book, in this Bible, I find many different authors that span many different epochs that keep pulling me back. There's something compelling about a young boy who's betrayed by his family, sold into slavery, whose forgiveness of that family saves the nation of Israel. There's something compelling about a reluctant, stuttering murderer who liberates and delivers a nation from slavery. A story that is so compelling and so 
compelling to this nation anyway that even throughout history, especially the slavery and the civil rights movement, it gets pulled again and again. The prophets in the Bible, all speaking truth to power when they're seeing their own people seduced and succumb to the transient and often self-defeating powers of this world. And there's definitely something compelling in the idea of God bursting into history through a refugee child born in poverty and oppression. And as this child grows into adulthood, he builds his ministry not from the rich and powerful, but mostly from the common and from the broken. Ultimately, he's betrayed by his friends and his religious leaders. He's tried unfairly, he's tortured, and he's executed by the state, leaving his ministry shattered and scattered. Now that's compelling enough, but what's even more compelling too beyond that is the Easter moment. There's something compelling about the idea of these women becoming the first evangelists, the first ones to sort of encounter and then spread, uh, spread the word. And this same shattered ministry that has got a bunch of people hiding in rooms, as we heard today. These people become the very public evangelists, the very public people representing their faith, and almost all come to very sticky ends at the end. A man who never even met Jesus and goes from being a persecutor of the faith to the greatest evangelist and really the only reason we are here in this church today. The initial Christian movement was mostly a Jewish movement. It was Paul that basically broke it out of that into the Gentile world. And it's something compelling about a faith that converts an empire, converts a Roman empire, the most powerful empire at the time, converts it only then to be in constant tension between the domination and the liberation, empire and salvation. There's something compelling about the lives and faiths of, of the ones that follow. St. Augustine, for example, who saw what Christianity could be in the fall of the Roman Empire. Martin Luther, who saw what Christianity could be in a faith that had succumbed to political power and corruption. John and Charles Wesley, who saw what Christianity could be in a nation still recovering from tearing itself apart from weaponized religion. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who saw what Christianity could be when, again, faith succumbed to political power. And then Martin Luther King Jr., who saw how Christianity could be a truly liberating force in a world built on oppression. And there are many, many, many more. Now, do you doubt this? Well, good, right? But don't just sit in doubt. Do something to explore the doubts that you may have. Ask the questions. Follow the questions. Even live the questions and fearlessly chase the questions. Pursue them now, by the way, when things are going well. Pursue them carefully when things are not going well. Pursue them with prayer. Pursue them with uh, devotions. Pursue them with action. Pursue them with others. Very challenging to do this on your own. And try to listen more than you speak. And for goodness sakes, develop your faith with humility. Now, that would have been a good spot to end. But I do want to just offer a little bit. So for some of you that do want and need a little bit more certainty, I can totally understand that. So let me tell you where over 30 years of chasing my questions have left me, right? Each and every one of you has the love of Christ in you. Each and every one of you, I believe, are loved beyond measure by the source of that love. Each and every one of you, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not what you've done, not what you haven't done, not what you will do, not what you won't do. You are forgiven. And finally, each and every one of you are children of love. You are God's. I don't doubt that. Amen. Let's join in singing, We Walk by Faith. sight. 
You may be seated. So for our call to action today, I've asked Joe to come up and give a, a, a quick conversation or quick some points about Share While You Shop. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Kerner. I'm on the Outreach Committee. I'm here to talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm here to kick off our Share While You Shop campaign. Uh, we've done this annually for many years. And this year, again, we'll be uh, helping out the Open Door. Uh, we uh, plan on having a representative uh, from the Open Door come next week, so I won't talk too much about, about them, um, but I will talk about our Share While You Shop campaign. So once again, we're collecting food and supplies. Uh, we're gonna collect those April through August, and it usually goes into September. And uh, we do that, and we have done that historically during the summer months. That's when kids are home, the demand for the food shelf is higher, and uh, you know there's the big March food campaign. Well, that's ended, and so you get into July and August, and the food supplies kind of dwindle. So we've uh, so we we do that in the summer to try to help that out. Uh, what we're going to do this year is we're going to have a different focus item for each month. Uh, if you remember last year, that's kind of how we did that, and we tailor that to what the open door is needing. Um, they publish a list that kind of says, these are our top five items, and so uh, for, we're going to start out with pasta and spaghetti sauce that's at the top of their list. So if you can, uh, when you're doing your shopping during the month, if you could buy, you know, we say suggest around $10 or whatever you feel compelled to do, uh, bring that in. We'll have the outreach corner in the back. Uh, there's a grocery cart back there. If you could bring that into the church and, and deposit them there, that'd be much appreciated. And then we'll bring, take that over to the open door. Um, it's a good way to get your kids involved. Uh, I've, you know, with a couple kids, have. it's a great way when you're out shopping, uh, get the kids involved, helping pick out the food or supplies. And so a uh, great way to get them involved with outreach. Uh, this year, our goal is to try to get to 2,000 pounds of uh, supplies and food. We're going to try to collect that during this campaign. So thank you very much for considering this. And uh, oh, I'm getting a signal. Yes, if, if you uh, would rather not bring in food, uh, you can certainly write a check as well. Uh, just designate it for Share While You Shop or the Open Door. We'll make sure those funds get to, get to them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Outreach Community, uh, Committee, I should say. Um, very, uh, very important ministry for sure. Other, other quick announcements I just want to make is uh, I, I want to again reemphasize the bags of blessings that we currently have out front. I think some people don't necessarily know what they're for, and I get it. Please, at some point, if you, uh, those bags are basically meant, you kind of pick them up. It's got stuff in it that is very helpful for people that are uh, either experiencing homelessness or basically just simply food or financial uh, insecurity. So just keep them in your bag, in your car, and then uh, when you see somebody on the on the street, you're not sure what to do. Give them a bag, bag of blessings, right? So they're out there, um, and uh, I, I put some more ones out there too. Other things that we have, I'm going to take this opportunity as youth pastor to quickly uh, pitch. Uh, we are going to resume our Bread of Life uh, sales uh, today. I want to just remind everyone that although my salary is paid for by the conference, nothing else in youth ministry is. So it runs entirely off of 
the donations of this congregation. This congregation has always been very supportive, so I want to thank you for that. And I just want to throw a little thing out there that on May 7th, in the spirit of something like Pancake Breakfast, the youth are going to be having a, uh, I'm calling it stay for the sermon, uh, sorry, come for the sermon, stay for the pie thing. We're going to have our basically a pie, um, I'm not going to say breakfast, but basically some kind of pie thing afterwards. And there is a rumor that there could be the possibility is that some ministers that you know and love may in fact experience pie in a way other than eating it. So, um, so that should be uh, pretty exciting. I, I can't wait to see how that evolves. Um, so we've now hit this point of, um, of the service where we are uh, invited to share ourselves and our gifts uh, with this world uh, this day. We're now uh, collecting our offering. What have we to offer? What have we to share? Coins from the copper, hearts filled with care. God will not falter, so let us dare. Lay it at the altar. What have we to offer? What have we to bring? Love ripe with laughter, hope that we can sing. Dreams of what we're after, promises of when. Lay it at the altar. May these gifts help us as a congregation be your voice, calling all people to abundant life and to their true identities as your beloved. Amen. You may be seated. And now in silence, let us uh, now in silence hear the prayers that you hold deep in your hearts. Christ, our living hope, breathe your spirit upon us. Fill us with your faith and love that we may believe and live the Easter miracle. Help us to believe where we have not seen, that others will see the risen Christ in us, arisen and changing the world today. Loving God, we pray for the many who do not have enough, enough food to eat or shelter to keep warm enough employment or money to pay their bills, enough medicine or medical care. And loving God, we also pray for those who have more than enough, but who struggle to find meaning and purpose in life, who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. Pour out on these people a spirit of gratitude and generosity. Eternal God, you rule with power and grace, justice and compassion. Keep watch over the nations. 
raise up honorable leaders who seek justice, love mercy, and pursue peace. Lord Jesus, as you gave sight to the blind, restored the crippled, and healed lepers, we pray that you would heal those who suffer in body, in mind, or in spirit. And we especially pray for all those who are going through hardship, who are going through the hardship that comes through physical, mental, or emotional stresses that we all encounter. And we pray for those who love celebrating with joy for birthdays, for anniversaries, for the accomplishments and milestones that come in life. Almighty God, you have called us to be the church. Pour out your spirit upon us here at Advent. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world through words and actions. May we, as a community, help the world experience the power of your compassion, grace, patience, steadfast love, and forgiveness. And God of life, we live most abundantly in your light and life. We remember this as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against, against, against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Please rise as we sing our closing Refreshed and restored, called and guided by the Holy Spirit, let us show signs of God's wonders this week. Let us go forth, remembering why Jesus came to us. Jesus came that all may have life and have it abundantly. In Christ, goodness and mercy will follow you. May goodness and mercy follow us all the days. Go in peace and see you next week.